één weg mag starten. Gelukkig heeft hij geluk gehad afgelopen donderdag na die aanrijding. Dit zijn de mannen van BMC. Als je het hebt over een ploeg die wel het gewicht moet gaan dragen, die de koers moet gaan dragen. Philippe Gilbert, de wereldkampioen. Team BMC dus uh, nu op het podium. Sterke ploeg met Marcus Boerghardt, met dus Philippe Gilbert, met Martin Kohler, Klaas Lodewijk, Amel Moanaar, Daniel Os. Michael Scher en wat is hij nu al sterk als je in dit soort klassiekers van 250 kilometer bijna kunt winnen. Die 200 kilometer ritten die zijn al voor hem. Vandaag de absolute topfavoriet. Hij zal vooral zijn en acht. De kleine man, daar is hij in het midden. Koenigo, links een beeld voor u. Winnaar van de Giro in 2004 alweer. Zoen begint nu pas echt. Damiano Cunigo. Natuurlijk bereidt hij zich voor op de Giro. En ook op dat Ardense klassieke duo. De Waalspel en Luik Bastenakelui. Daar kan hij ook winnen. En dan hebben we op. Dat is de ploeg van Katusha. Hoe zou het zijn met deze man? Hoe zou het zijn met... Rodriguez, 33 jaar, winnaar van de Waalse Pijl vorig jaar. Natuurlijk altijd favoriet in Amsterdam Goldrace. Werd al tweede in 2009. Nog werk verrichten voor zijn kopman. Johnny Meersman zal ook zeer sterk voor de dag komen. Mijn man moet rijden en uh, mocht er een kans zijn dat ik ergens... Uh... Makkelijker rijden. En Andy Schleck ja, niet een uh, optimaal willen doen. U weet wellicht vorig jaar een breuk in het heiligbeen na een val in de Dauphiné. Geen tour, alles ging bergaf. Werd daarna vaak afgestapt of zwak in de Brabantse pijl. Hij werd de derde in uh, die koers en heeft nu een hele grote El Imbatido bij zich staan. Alejandro Valverde. De kampioen is er ook bij uit die Spaanse equipe. Hij is er ook bij, Tom Dumoulin. Mag zwaaien naar de markt in Maastricht. Dit is zijn Maastricht. Na de hechtingen in de knie, na die valpartij in de circuit de la Sarte, dacht hij, dit is ook de coureurs op de kinderkopjes van de markt in Maastricht. Nog even rustig met elkaar kletsend. Ze weten, de eerste kilometers altijd wat rustiger voor hem. De eerste 100 kilometer en daarna gaan ze toch echt allemaal vol aan de bak. 34 beklimmingen, zoals gezegd vandaag. Vier keer de Kouwberg. 4000 hoogtemeters, dat is echt bijzonder zwaar. En we gaan niet meer beginnen met de, de, met de, de um, klim in uh, Elslo, de Maasberg, maar we gaan beginnen met als uh, renner. De mannen van uh, Garmin, dus Riddershek. En we kunnen terug naar uh, Maurice. Snel met Palma. 10 seconden nog voor uh, Francesco Moser en Leo van Vliet. Laten we die maar eens even meeluisteren daar met die laatste secondes vlak voor de start. 2, 1, 1, 2, 3. En dan kunnen ze vertrekken dus. De coureurs, 25 ploegen in totaal op weg. Amstel Gold Race in its 48th edition. That was first one in 1966 by Jean Stablinski, a Frenchman. Only one other French win since then, that was Bernard Hinault in 1981. He, of course, the last man to win it in the rainbow jersey. Philippe Gilbert of Belgium hoping to replicate that feat today. Well, Maastricht just around 10 kilometers away from the finish line where we speak to you from right now. Just along the road, there's Bert van Marwijk, the uh, former Dutch national team coach in soccer. Just being shown around the course. And once they were out of Maastricht, ceremonial start finished and the official start was given. Didn't take too long for a breakaway to form, more of which we'll tell you about in just a moment's time. Well, there is that official start on a redesigned course this year for the Amstel Gold Race. Quite a few changes 
The finish line has been brought into line with that that we saw at the World Championships last year. And as I said, did not take long for those attacks to begin. Not all of them got away. I can tell you, there is no Francis Dejour presence in the break as it stands. But there are seven men up the road and they've had rather a large advantage so far. One of the men on the left-hand side of your screen there, Johan van Summelen, attacking with around 12 kilometres gone. And he would soon have plenty of company. 2011 Paris-Roubaix winner. Hasn't dealt brilliantly well with the weight of expectation that's been placed on him since. But a chance for Garmin to salvage something from what has been a pretty poor spring campaign so far. Took Van Summer and had his colleagues a while. Op en kont gepakt door dezelfde Rabobankploeg en toen voor oud vuil aan de kant gezet. Dus, Maarten, wiens brood men eet, wiens woord men spreekt, ja. juist. U ziet de namen van...
So it did settle down, seven of those riders are away, I can tell you that they are Astad Loza, Van Overberg, Van Sommeren, Plushin, Ses, Vogondi and De Troyer. Two from the same team, they come from the Accent Jobs 1T team. I am cycling also involved, as you can see, Garmin Shop. Euskal Tele Euskadi, who finally had a couple of good days after a shocking spring so far. And the Top Sport Vlaanderen Balois team, you can always bet on to instigate breakaways and attacks in this part of the world. Kind of euphony involved with Class Cess as well. I can tell you that... Geist. Ja. Er is gevallen, kijk. Ja. Namen die je niet altijd tegenkomt als het om een Nederlands peloton gaat of een buitenlands peloton. Het is wel een leuk peloton. Het zou een, uh, een klein advocatenbureau uit, uh, nou pak weg, uh, weet ik veel wat, Brugge kunnen zijn. Asterloza van Summeren, de Troyer, Vogondi, Seis.
ploeg. Geen, ik zit te tellen, zevenmans formatie, Maarten, waar je hart heel snel van gaat kloppen. Nou, dan is jouw hart beduidend bedaarder dan dat van mij, want dat is sowieso... Kijk, want daar zitten toch wel een paar jongens in uh, die wat kunnen. Astraloza is echt een hardrijder van Summeren. En kijk eens eventjes, 100 kilometer. 10 minuten voor. 10 minuten. En het peloton heeft met een gemiddelde van een kilometertje of... Uh, Ze met de handrem aan hebben gekoerst en nog niet voluit gaan gaan. Hier kijken we naar Klaas Seijs en hier Astaloza. Nou, die Astaloza, ja. dat is een taaie oude knar. Maar dan nog, dan nog begint dat weliswaar ingedeukte hart van me eh, toch niet echt veel sneller te kloppen. Maar nou is het leuk, we hebben net het peloton gezien voordat de live uitzending begon. En daar rijden dus drie groene mannen voorop. En dat hele peloton rijdt dus in een soort toeristentempo door... Ik heb een naar een man van de Thank you. 
Kijk, daar gaan ze al uh, bidons aan geven hier, zie je? Kijk hoe ze die bidons pakken, kijk. Couple of crashes, a couple of nasty moments so far. We've seen riders such as uh, Ben King having to walk up on one of those banks. The climbs are absolutely packed with people, with the good weather helping as well. We've seen a couple of falls as well. The likes of Martin Velitz has gone down, Brian Bulgach, Tosh van der Sande. But they've all rejoined the peloton. They're all still riding, and nothing too serious as of yet, thankfully. Well, doing most of the work thus far have been Pere Sagan and Moreno Moser's Cannondale team. Lots of pressure on them today. Interesting to see how the race tactics work out and it plays out throughout the afternoon. Just one of the many climbs that will be taken on today. 34 in total. Confirm Asta Loza van Overberg of Euskal Tel and Topsport Vlaanderen. Garmin have Johan van Summeren, the 2011 Paris Roubaix winner. Axa Jobs Wanti with Tim de Troyer and Nicolas Vogondi. Krillin Euphony with Klaas Sess. And I Am Cycling have the Moldova national champion, the ex Katusha man, Alexander Plushin. Well, we've seen the likes of Paterski working on the front alongside Stefano Agostini, who's in his second year as a pro. Could control this. Lars Bohm not far from the front for Blanco as well. They've actually said today that they've named co-leaders. 
as our breakaway takes on one of the many bits of dangerous bits of road around this area. Well, this is something they've introduced to this race as a test. They're showing some uh, slow mo shots, um, so they've got a special camera on uh, on course today. So. We'll be able to see as the race develops, we'll see some of uh, the replays in slow motion. Canada at the front then, trying to set up and work for Pedro Sagan, who's had such a great start to the season. Sagan, third last year here, hasn't finished outside any of the top two in any of the one-day races he's competed in this season. Right through from the GP Camayora that he won, he was second as well in uh, Stade Bianchi since one in Ghent Vevelgem. Of course, on Wednesday at Brabant Pale, second in Flanders as well. He has had a magnificent start of the year. He's expected to go on and ride Flesh Wallon as well if he feels that his legs are good here, but he reckons that liege on the edge is too difficult for him. So his programme this year doesn't include the Giro d'Italia. Expecting to take a rest after Wednesday afternoon. And we'll see the Slovakian champion next in California, Tour de Suisse, the Tour de France, and the US Pro Cycling Challenge. He's certainly a marked man today, though. Big, big week for him, as it is for Moreno Moser as well. Just It's easy to forget that he's only in his second year as a pro, the second prong man, and perhaps a reserve option today for Cannondale. Yeah, and what a good reserve uh, to have. He's uh, coming of age, and it was his um, um, Moser senior that um, was here, Francesco Moser, that started this uh, event this morning and was, was uh, enjoying himself in the, the VIP area just opposite. But yeah, there's a bit more uh, speed at the front uh, of this race as they, they, ta you know, they tackle these climbs. And it's also important to, uh, to concentrate and to be at the front. Uh, you can just see Peter winning. Um, I was going to say fresh from uh, a good ride in the, the Basque country, but a lot of riders um, found it difficult, you said, uh, the uh, temperatures here are, are a lot better than they were in the Basque Country in uh, most of the season already, apart from obviously when they, they started in the Tour Down Under and earlier on in the year, the first World Tour event down in Australia and then off to uh, Qatar and Oman, but for a lot of these riders, this is the first time they've had their summer jersey, the summer weight jersey, because a lot of the teams give the kind of winter weight jersey, a thicker jersey, you know, obviously the arm warmers, leg warmers, and we've seen so many of these races uh, with them all wrapped up. But today, you can just see in the centre, uh, the Blanco rider got the zip down. That looks to me like it's the Lars Boom, uh, the former uh, Dutch champion in there. And, you know, Blanco have got a bit of pressure. This is one of their home races. And again, they're looking for a sponsor uh, for this uh, Team Blanco to continue. If not, They'll be looking for uh, other teams, so a bit of pressure on them today, but everybody's sitting behind the uh, lime green of uh, Cannondale, putting two riders towards the frontier. Again, they have got the out-and-out -out favourite, and you did say that uh, Peter Sagan, not outside the uh, the top two in a lot of these major events, and um, he has made a few mistakes. You've got to remember, he's still young. He's made a few mistakes. He's 23. Yeah. 23 years of age, it's and amazing. Absolutely, yeah, he's got a good 10 years ahead of him, and OK, he hasn't won everything, uh, and he comes into most of these uh, these classics as one of the favourites, and you know he ha he was beaten hands down in, in Flanders by um, by uh, Cancellara, who isn't in this uh, race today. He concentrates on the, the cobble classics. This is a bit different race, but it's all about concentration and uh, keeping in, keeping you know in the top ten rather than the top twenty or thirty. You really have to be right near the front in this, and very important early on to eat because um, these, ra these hills come thick and fast afterwards, the bunch string out, they come back, and you, you forget about you know, the uh, nutrition you need for this, this event. 251.8 kilometers, a long way. It's gonna be over six hours in the saddle, and it's very important to get the nourishment down, as you can see, Van Sommeren just chewing in one of these bars at the moment. Well, interesting you mentioned the route. It's long, complicated, and nervous, all round difficult, really. Starting in the city of Maastricht, heading out into this same Limburg region where the World Championships were held last September. Right from the off, classified climbs to take on, 34 of them in total, at two more than the 2012 edition, and they include four passages of the famous Kohlberg climb, the top of which the race used to finish, and we've already had a bit of a smash further down the peloton. Oh dear, oh dear. It's, it's cross-country stuff at the minute. 
Normally you see this in the winter in cyclocross, yeah, it looks as if a lot of pushing and shoving. This looks to me as it's happened a bit nearer the front. Uh, 10 Dam is down there, one of the I Am. You've got uh, Gilbert, the world champion, one of the favourites down. I think a bit tangled up, but it looks as if 10 Dam. This, to me, has happened near the front with so much uh, difficulty in pushing and shoving. Well, he's one of the men that they usually sit on the front, and an another indicator that it is at the front as well is the fact that Philippe Gilbert's gone down. I can tell Rui Costa as well is one of Movistar's main men for today. Is a Lamprey rider down as well as Gilbert is the man that patiently waits for an energy bar. Rainer Honig is the Krillin Euphony man involved. Yeah, the, you just see the experience in Gilbert. It's, he, he's not... He's not hurt himself it's just he's tangled up his bike he's looking for his spare bike no real panic everybody will know there's been a you know this crash in the peloton they won't push on it's just nice and easy he knows if he panics he's going to waste a bit of energy trying to get back but the the most the most uh, person that was uh, damaged there was uh, 10 down but it looks as if everybody will get back safely so uh, yeah everybody can breathe a wee bit in the team cars Simone Stortoni was the Lampier rider involved, and this is what happened then. Look at the front of the bunch. Yeah, right Narrow near the roads. front. Yeah. Ooh, about 30 bike lengths back, not even that, you're right. And that sent people all over the farmland. Not good at all. Plenty of riders, that's at least 10, 11, 12 riders off their bikes set. Well, we did say it's about concentration, Robbie, and then could happen, just a touch of wheels and bang, it goes down. and. Uh, 10 Dam was one of the first ones and you can just see the reaction back here everybody just taken to the uh, field at the sides and fortunately the weather is good enough and, and the uh, the um, the field is you know not cut up as it would be and, and you know the riders can ride round but uh, yeah it's uh, you don't see this often you certainly don't cyclocross season extended there you got a bit of extra time cyclocross for you as uh, Peter Sagan was almost cut up just about managed to stay on his bike if you see right at the base of that shot and again around 25 30 riders having to take the muddy route one of the lamprey guys in fact over the hedge dear oh dear oh dear oh, we were just talking about the route when that happened Corberg of course has been it's not the finish now just under two kilometers from the finish and here are the guys who were involved attempting to get back on Ashley Dozer had Steve Schoenel involved, who, uh, after today, will take a holiday. Certainly not an easy way to finish, but Schubert might have to expend a bit of extra energy, but, again, you would not expect him to push on if the world champion's down in there. No, I don't think anybody does. A lot of people respect Philip Gilbert. He's, um, you know, trying to come back, but he isn't given uh, full gas at the moment. He's, he's just, you know, hanging back, waiting for the uh, the team cars to come past, and he'll slip in behind them. No real panic, uh, because I don't think anybody will be really pushing on. It's uh, Lars Bomb. Uh, we've seen, we know that uh, one of his teammates, Ten Dam, is at the front, and you know, Lars Bomb is. Um, we said they would be taking it easy, but it doesn't look as if he's uh, he's uh, taking it easy in this uh, descent. No etiquette, no respect from Lars Bohm there. He's had it. My yeah. opportunity, he says. You can just see he's, um, he's Philip Gilbert waving the cars by. This is the important part. Getting the cars by, getting in behind the cars and getting up and uh, not uh, wasting a, a lot of energy in doing this. But for me, I can't really understand why Lars Bohm, especially if 10, ten Dam is down, can't understand why uh, Lars Boom is pushing on. Former champion of the Netherlands, former uh, world champion at cyclocross, but uh, there'll be a lot of riders. You can just see them putting their hand up to their ear and listening to see what damage there is behind. But uh, for me, Lars Boom maybe uh, taking away what. Uh die zijn vrij hard en die rijden met de renners mee. We zijn de ellende van de afgelopen weken zijn we kwijt. Hopen we zeer. Zij rijden nu de Sibbe Grubber op, die we straks ook in de finale nog tegen gaan komen. Die ploeg van Asterloza heeft deze week zijn eerste overwinning gehad, niet waar, Maarten? Ja, ik geloof eergisteren hebben ze een massasprintje gewonnen met Urta Soen. Ja. Dit is Summi. Dat is een hele leuke man om mee te praten. Die zou je zo een talkshow geven op de televisie. Grappige man met een hele beide hand te vrouw.
Deveman aan de leiding. En daarachter is het één grote Tutti Frutti. Overal groepen en groepjes na een valpartij waar Philippe Gilbert hier in beeld een van de slachtoffers was. En waar ook andere lagen die minder snel op de fiets kwamen. Ja, Laurens ten Dam bijvoorbeeld. Ik vind die moet hier een... nog achter zitten. Jazeker, als die er al op staat. Maar ik vind het toch vreemd. Ik bedoel, een lekke band tot daar aan toe. Maar nu zo'n circus van auto's. En dat die jongens gewoon terug kunnen komen in het wiel. Een boom die zich hier opoffert in de eerste groep van het peloton. Ja, maar goed. Dit, is dus, dit zijn de eerste achtervolgers. Zullen we zeggen dat deze groep pak een beet 30, 35 man is? Ja, en de hele blanke ploeg min Laurens de Dam rijdt daar. Mollema daar in vierde positie. Peter Velits zien we daar. Uh, Kwartowski hier zo in zijn quickstep shirt. Die Pol. In de Ronde van Vlaanderen goed. Toen is hij naar zijn woonplaats in Polen gegaan. En heeft daar alleen maar een week lang Pols gegeten. Nu rijdt hij weer goed. Ik zie daar Bert-Jan Lindeman op de tweede positie. Die wijst dat de motor weg moet. En... Eerste achtervolgers, de groep boven zeg maar. Ja, met Lindeman in zijn wiel. Dus Lindeman zit achter een boom en is dit Sagan? Nee, nee dat, dat is, is nog, nog niet Sagan. Ik zie geen Sagan. Sagan zit er niet bij. Nou, er komen nog vandaar... heel wat groepjes aan hoor. Ja, maar vandaar dat boom dus zo doortrekt. Sagan zit er niet bij. En dat is de reden dat er zo gereden wordt. En dat de gentlemen's agreements even overboord worden gezet. We willen best op elkaar wachten, maar niet als er te grote voordelen zijn te behalen. Dit is dan de tweede groep die toch alweer wat beter samenklit. En daar is Joubert aan het laatste wiel aankomen sluiten met de hulp van de auto's. En zijn ploegmaten die houden hem nu uit de wind. Spitana. Ja. Ja. Gilbert dove c'è anche Peter Sagan. Per l'altro poco prima della, della caduta Radio Corsa aveva segnalato che in coda al gruppo c'era proprio Peter Sagan che stava eh, chiedendo assistenza alla propria ammiraglia, alla macchina della Cannonball. Burgard è lui il corridore con la maglia rosso-nera della BNC e Spilak adesso sta cercando di entrare nel gruppetto dei 40. 
questo invece è il gruppo grosso il gruppo più numeroso quello che in grafica vedete con un ritardo di 7 minuti e 55 è rientrato Gilbert di questo gruppo eh, fa parte anche Boissonaghen un altro dei reduci dal Parigi Roubaix tanto stanno parlando gli uomini della Blanco c'è cioè Mollema, uno dei capitani della formazione olandese anche se è stato costretto a rinunciare al giro dei Paesi Baschi per febbre ed è Lars Bomma che controlla 4-5 corridori della Blanco davanti di questo gruppetto di 30 35 corridori e l'unico corridore della Canon. Esatto, ricordiamo che l'unico corridore della Canon è Moreno Moser, lo abbiamo visto intorno alla decima posizione, Van Endert con Tepstra, con Joachim Rodriguez, con Dani Moreno nelle prime posizioni del gruppo che sta eh, inseguendo dietro, possiamo dire che il ritardo non, eh, non mi sembra sia di 30 secondi Davide, dovrebbero essere più vicini. No? Adesso sì, c'è anche Daniel Oss, bensì in seconda posizione. Gregario del campione del mondo eccolo Sagan l'abbiamo visto transitare adesso Peter Sagan Wanni campione nazionale francese coda anche Kirienka molto forte al giro dei Paesi Baschi corridore del team Sky Burgart primo piano per lui poi Ben Hermans, l'abbiamo visto nella prima parte del gruppo con Del Fosse. Un po' l'argomento che ha tenuto banco in questi giorni, come si fa a battere uno come Peter Sagan, perché anche nei giorni scorsi alla freccia del Brabante insomma, ha dato una dimostrazione di forza clamorosa per, eh, per la vittoria, soprattutto per come l'ha ottenuta questa eh, vittoria mettendo sotto un uomo del calibro di eh, Philippe Gilbert. Bisognerà assolutamente inventarsi qualcosa, aveva detto per esempio Rinaldo Nocentini, ma andiamola ad ascoltare proprio il toscano della AG Deser, sempre con Alessandro De Stefano. Nocentini. Secondo me è sicuramente un po' più difficile tatticamente che l'anno passato perché dal Cauberg ancora rimane un 20 km e c'è la, la possibilità di provare ad anticipare sicuramente dipende dai corridori che rimarranno davanti e se sono là sicuramente cercherò ad anticipare perché con un Sagan così è, 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 è meglio farsi trovare davanti. Ma io sono d'accordo con Nocentini Davide quest'anno con il cambio di, di percorso al di là dello spostamento dell'arrivo ma con questo final ronde come dicono qua appunto il circuito eh, mondiale inserito nel finale beh io credo che da un punto di vista tattico sia assolutamente più difficile da interpretare una corsa come questa Amazon più difficile da interpretare perché sono più numerosi i corridori che possono aspirare al successo con il cover nel finale con soprattutto la salita delle antenne il Kirchberg a pochi chilometri dal traguardo pochi potevano vincere adesso sono molti di più Sussberger Orica Grineggio in Intanto il ritardo è intorno ai 18-19 secondi tra i due gruppi. Michael Asher, poi lo svizzero della BMC, è lui adesso in testa al gruppo. La BMC, chiaramente una volta ha atteso Felipe Gilbert, una volta che il campione del mondo è riuscito a rientrare nel grosso del plotone, beh, adesso sta eh, guidando, sta comandando l'inseguimento alla prima parte del gruppo, gruppo che, ricordiamolo, si è spezzato una decina di chilometri fa in quella caduta, nella quale sono rimasti coinvolti tra gli altri Andy Schleck, Rui Costa e eh, appunto Filippo e Gilbert. Questo era il secondo passaggio anche per il gruppo sul Cauberg, altri due volte dovranno scavalcare questa salita, questa piccola montagna che sovrasta Balkenburg, noi adesso andiamo ad ascoltare un altro dei possibili protagonisti di oggi, vale a dire Roman Kreuziger, sempre con Alessandro De Stefano, Kreuziger. Vedremo come si muove la corsa, se qualcuno aspetta o se si, se si muove come si muoveva sempre su Kreuzberg. Noi abbiamo una squadra forte, e forse vedremo come, come, sa, come saremo lì e cosa faremo. Quindi non l'hai visto il percorso, il finale? Sì, sì, non l'ho visto. L'ho visto. Che sembra? Perché alcuni dicono che è più duro, altri dicono che è meno duro. Ma rispetto a prima sicuramente è più, è più facile, perché le salite si muovono un po' più avanti e non sono dure decisive come prima. 
però dopo 230 km sai, dipende dalle gambe. Tu come stai? Io molto bene, sono felice di essere alle classiche dopo tre anni che non le ho fatte e non vedo ora di partecipare. No, ma si parla tanto della sfida, prima era cancellare Kreuziger, eh, scusa, cancellare eh, Sagan, adesso Gilbert Sagan, che ne pensi tu? Ma penso che Gilbert Sagan forse è solo per oggi, invece Gilbert sarà tutta la settimana e non c'è solo lui, ci saranno tanti altri come Valverde, Rodriguez, poi ci siamo anche noi, quindi... È una corsa molto nervosa questa, secondo te si dice bisogna aspettare fino all'ultimo per deciderla o bisognerà attaccare prima? Ma bisogna salvare più energie possibile e poi si vedrà come sono le gambe dopo 200 km. E intanto mentre la regia olandese ci regala diciamo così questi, questi replay, qua operazioni di stretching per Astar Loza, diceva Kreuziger soltanto oggi sulla carta la sfida tra Gilbert e Sagan io non la escluderei neanche per mercoledì alla freccia vallone eh, Davide. sicuramente non domenica prossima alla Liegi perché Sagan non la farà la tua Ieri. mentre oggi sono loro due i grandi favoriti in pole position Sagan subito dietro la campione del mondo mercoledì non ci sono solamente loro due perché ci saranno i colombiani ci sarà Joaquim Rodriguez e qualche altro campione perché Sagan non credo che sia ancora protagonista o comunque il primo favorito di un mercoledì prossimo ma il muro di Wii non è impossibile per lui eh no, già lo ha, lo ha fatto capire che insomma magari non quest'anno ma in un futuro forse anche abbastanza vicino se non lo vedremo un protagonista anche sulle rampe del muro di Wii Peter Sagan intanto è transitato in mezzo alle ammiraglie dunque aveva perso contatto Andy Schleck che dunque oggi almeno un segno di sicuro non lo lascerà e questo invece è il momento in cui si va a ricompattare il gruppo alle spalle dei sette attaccanti dunque sono di nuovo tutti insieme c'è stato un attacco ma non portato a fondo dagli uomini del team blanco perché a fare l'andatura a tirare soprattutto c'è stato un corridore si trattava eh, di Lars Bom scampato pericolo dunque sono rientrati dal dalla seconda parte del gruppo, tutti insieme adesso alle spalle dei sette attaccanti, quando mancano poco meno di 80 km alla conclusione. Altro favorito, lo vediamo lì a centro gruppo con la maglia blu e verde della Movistar, Alejandro Valverde. Non è lui, perché adesso si trova intorno alla decima posizione, questo è Immanuel Erviti. E lui il capitano della Movistar, Valverde, che non è mai riuscito a fare granché l'Anfe Gold Race, ma quest'anno potrebbe dire la sua. Dovrebbe essere lui il capitano appunto della Movistar, c'è eh, su Valverde la grande incognita della sua eh, condizione, perché è da diverso tempo che non corre Valverde dunque non sappiamo bene, nessuno sa esattamente in che condizione si è presentato all'Amstel non ha corso il Giro dei Paesi Vaschi corsa che preferiscono tutti coloro che puntano a queste classiche dal momento che ci sono tante salite è arrivato quarto al Gran Premio Miguel Indurain il 30 marzo è arrivato secondo nell'arrivo in salita alla Vuelta a Catalogna ha corso poco e si è allenato tanto e mi sembra che oggi stia particolarmente bene. L'anno scorso la... You know, the Ardennes Classic, although we're in Limburg today, uh, in the Netherlands, and, uh, you know, they class this as the, uh, you know, the, the kind of Ardennes week. We've got Flesh Will On uh, later uh, on Wednesday. Uh, it's um, not as long as the uh, Liège, Baston Liège or Amstel Gold, sitting just about 200 kilometers, but, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's an opportunity for Quintana, he, he showed uh, great form in uh, the Basque country and, and taking that and beating, beating Richie Port, finishing second to the world champion Tony Martin in the final time trial. So he looks as if he's got some, some good form, but uh, Movistar have come with a very, very strong team. You've mentioned quite a few of them. And, um, you know, Amador, Quintana, Vite, De Costa, Madrazo, Lastras, Valverde, Visconti, it's such a strong team and they've come here. Uh, Valverde has already said to the press that he wants to come here and, and do well in the Ard Ardennes races and uh, you know, try and do something today. BMC have got a very, very strong team. Cannondale have got a, a team where they've got you know, the favourite. One of the riders was just getting dropped to the back of the peloton, so he's done his job, uh, which has been very difficult for a lot of them. Um, Sky Pro Cycling have come here. 
I know that from listening to race radio that uh, Boston Hagen was uh, going back for bottle. So I don't think after Roubaix he didn't feel too good. I don't think Boston Hagen is a man uh, that they're looking after today. Maybe a case of uh, Uran or maybe even Sergio Henao, who, who looked uh, very good in, uh, in the Basque Country. But they have got some uh, some good quality riders in there. We know that uh, Kirienka has been on the deck earlier on today. But, uh, yeah, Thursday worked this, and that's why um, tanking there on the right-hand side for Blanco in the black, white and blue. As after that hard effort, it's going back to the car and uh, it's taking on some uh, liquids for the rest of the team. Sixty-eight kilometres to go. Five minutes twenty-eight. Now the gap has halved from what it was early on in the day. Climbed above just above eleven minutes. In fact, very very early on once the riders had got away. And at the moment, it's a combination of different teams doing work at the front. Not too much organisation, but it's strung out fairly well, which means that the pace is high. Yeah, they they know that if they they want to win, especially uh, Katusha, they have got some numbers, and uh, you know we just mentioned the team and. They have got some um, some good riders there, and what they don't want to do is make this Amstel Gold um, too easy. Uh, they don't want too many riders coming to this uh, final loop, uh, the penultimate climb up the Coburg. They want to, you know, possibly have a, a group of about 40 or 50 to try and split it up. They don't want to give uh, Peter Sagan an easy ride. Um, Cannondale, his team in the lime green, have disappeared from the front of this race. They have been riding for so long, but uh, now they've kind of dropped into the peloton. Now it's a, a chance of uh, you know looking after Peter Sagan. I think they're just in the middle of the picture there, just there, uh, with uh, Peter Sagan and about three riders round about him. So uh, the likes of Movistar and um, Katusha have Movistar one rider, Katusha two riders towards the front. The rider in the white is uh, Volkanov, the Russian champion. They just want to keep the pressure on. They don't want to, this race to be too easy because it suits their riders for the uh, tempo to be difficult. 58 at the back is Romain Sicard, the uh, French mask rider, who's struggling to keep in contact with the group. You can just look at all these people out on the roads. T-shirt weather today. Might even be barbecue weather for some of them on the site. There's plenty of the sponsor's tipple being drunk as well, we can assure you, across here in the VIP area and out on the course as they're in Kadir and Kir. That's the breakaway with 67 kilometres left. Nicolas de Loza, part of... An Euskaltel team today that does include Igor Anton, Mikel Landis here as well, as are the Izagirre brothers. They had a great start of the season in the Tour Down Under. More points in one day than they had in uh, 2012 altogether, those brothers. But they've yes. since not been able to back it up. Been difficult for them and uh, they just managed to get through last year. I believe they had to sell one of the team buses to, to keep funding the, uh, the team. and. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult time for them and they took on some foreign riders with their points to, to stay in the World Tour. Uh, that was a big decision for them, of course, because it all goes down to the philosophy of developing riders, the Basque riders, and it's something we've seen with the soccer teams of the region as well. Athletic Bilbao and other teams, as you see Kirienka out on the road for Sky. You can just see the mud in the back of the shorts, or a bit of dust and you know, a couple of wee cuts in his arms. He has been off uh, earlier on today. And uh, you know one of the uh, young riders, Edmondson, towards the back, Lars Boom, who was uh, one of the riders that uh, decided to push on when that crash happened. Doesn't look as if he's going the whole way with a, a skin suit on. He knew that uh, you know he's going to do as much uh, as much work for the team as possible. Uh, and this this rider is a big rider. Uh, this doesn't really suit him. But uh, at the back here, Kirienka. Uh, after his crash, just in front of him, you've got uh, the uh, young rider from Team Sky, and that is um, Josh Edmondson. But yeah, Kirienka, he rode kilometre after kilometre at the front. Um, for, he does that all year, and that's why I was taken on to Team Sky. A very good team rider. Set to a team like uh, Team Sky for this sort of race. Um, but towards the front of Mobile, Star rider was in fact the captain. That's uh, Pablo Lastras. So they want to keep the pressure on. They don't. They want to split this race up. They don't want it to become uh, a 20-man or 30-man group sprint because that plays into the hands of Peter Sagan. So yeah, more and more teams coming up towards the front because uh, Cannondale weren't pushing hard enough. 
do think the two worried about this breakaway just under five minutes with 65 kilometers to go especially with uh, so many climbs to come there's a large bunch and what they want to do is keep the pressure on to uh, whittle it down interesting you mentioned Vasily Kiryenka there I think one of the protagonists of the one of the best wins of a Grand Tour stage I've won in De Sestria a couple of years ago when he was in his Movistar days. It was his first season out of the two he spent there. And it happened just a couple of days after uh, poor Xavi Tondo had died out training in Sierra Nevada. And it was a win that they really dedicated to him. Everybody very hurt, upset in the team. The man went out and rode for his dear life. It was a real hard man ride into the mountains in Italy and one that I'm sure will go down in the history of the Movistar team as one of the best. 65 k's to go, 4 minutes 51 the gap. You can just see a few of the teams starting to get organised again at the front. We talked about Movistar and Katusha sharing out the work. The Mega Farmer Quick Step have got three bodies there. Mega Farmer Quick Step who've had uh, a pretty poor spring, it has to be said. But they've had a chance to win sprints, they haven't always done it. And I know that Mark Cavendish won't have been too happy with uh, a couple of the lead outs he had. You look back to the Skelder Prize when he was really left on his own in the last couple of kilometers. Did the best sprint of the lot, but unfortunately wasn't good enough to get past Marcel Kittel, who'd started around 20 bike lengths in front of him and in the end won the stage. They had the bone and bad luck as well. And things not quite going well for Chavanel or Terupstra in the rest of the classics. It's just been an offspring really for Mega Pharma Quick Step. Yeah, it's not been the perfect um, you know, start for them. You know, they, they had a Belgian team, they, they love the uh, big classic races, they want to do well in the classic races. Missing Boonen is a big loss to them, but it just means that um, it kind of opens the door to a, a lot of other riders. And for me, Brabant Spiel did, did a few good performances there and something to build on for the, uh, for the future. One of the men that has produced uh, one of the most positive aspects of their season before riding today, 1-1-2, Mikhail Kwiatkowski, who we saw in the Tirana Adriatico. He's just up towards the front there, Robbie. Uh, we just seen a, a, a pick up over there. He's just sitting probably, you know, six, seven back. There's a couple of riders round about him. And, uh, you know, he's another rider that could possibly podium in this race. So, yeah. They are looking after him as much as possible, and he could be a, a real outsider. Lars Bohm at the back of the peloton, and after all the work he's put in, whether it be the right ethics or not, doesn't matter. He is spent, I think, for the day now. And Lars Bohm, as you said, might well be climbing off sometime. Waves everybody past, that's enough for him. You can just see he started. It um, looks like um, all over for Kirienka as well for uh, Team Sky. It just gets harder and harder and, uh, you know, no place to hide and the worst place to be at this moment uh, when uh, Movistar and Katush are starting to uh, keep the pressure on and this gap is uh, coming down to the seven in front is at the back because, again, we're into this town with turns left and right and, you know, it's a big elastic band effect and, you know, uh, the effect has to happen and uh, Lars Boom put a bit of pressure on. He did start, start with overshoes and uh, skin suit on, so, again... In a, a distance race like this, it's not, um, you know, aerodynamics come into play, but uh, at the end of the day, you need something with uh, pockets on to, uh, to store your food because you're going to need a lot of nutrition to get through this uh, distance. So a pre-thought-out plan, as we see Vorganov at the front. He's a Russian champion, Edward Vorganov, number 78 for uh, Katusha team. We've had an up-and-down winter, as you've mentioned many a time through the spring. It's the reason that we're going to see the extra team in the Giro d'Italia next month. There's 23 as opposed to 22 in the Grand Tour. This is Lars Bohm again. He's got his aerodynamics right down to the helmet, which has been a rather new part of fashion that I know we've talked to death about over this spring. But it is another part of the changing fashion in how people approach races. See. The crowd's not just confined to the climbs, people pit stopping the cars and peering over bridges. It's a big, big event in this part of the world. Four minutes 43, and as a result of these accelerations, the likes of Bone being left off. Looks to be a top sport Vlander and Balois rider he's with. They've got a couple of riders today, Sven. Four and a half a minute for skill. And the kopgroep you see ook al langzamerhand tekenen van slijtage vertonen. Verbrokkeling, geen mooi regelmatig tempo. Jongens die moeten verzaken. 
gaatjes die ertussen vallen. Je klimt ook naar de onzichtbare kaap van 200 kilometer. Er staat geen lijn op de weg straks 200 kilometer hier. Maar ik heb hem wel eens laten vertellen door profs zoals jij en anderen. Dus Rodriguez heeft plannen. En die zit mannen als Carusa. En die hebben ook nog Kolobnev en, en, en Vicioso en Vorgenov en Moreno en Spilak. Spilak is een heel goede vorm op het moment. Het is een heel sterk ploegje ook. Dus ploegje. Hier zo voor en is een kampioenstrui. En een heel contingent quicksteppers met op de vierde plek Terpstra. En ook heel veel kanselij met Leukeman zit daar. En Marcato daar verscholen achter Terpstra. Een beetje moeizaam voorjaar, maar hij schijnt er door te komen. Er is nogal wat kritiek gevallen deze week op Wiggins. Ik wil graag jouw mening horen van Wiggins komt nergens. Wiggins heeft, en dat heeft Sky duidelijk laten weten, Wiggins heeft zijn zinnen gezet op de Ronde van Italië. En Wiggins heeft geheel in eigen stijl geroepen van... Was at the front, flicking that right arm, hoping that Van Sumlen's going to come through. There's got to be some sort of quick organisation here if they're going to survive for another set of kilometres. Hasta Loza Van Sumlen plus in confirmation of the Basque Spaniard. Van Sumlen, of course, in Garmin and the Moldova national champion. Riding for I am cycling. Look behind from Astad Loza. Plenty of movement behind. In the meantime, we still have just eased off slightly on the climb. And it's Katusha. There are two men at the front. Yeah, this was the opportunity for Gilbert to go back. He knows this climb was, you know, it was a, a good road. He knows there wasn't any real panic. It's not as if it's one of these uh, small roads that there might be a crash, which he was involved with before. And, You've got to remember that um, you know they have race radio. Talking over the race radio, every one of your teammates can hear. So sometimes a, a private conversation with your sports director about how you're feeling and that you don't really want that to go out to the rest of your team if you've been through a bad patch or, or, or something like that. So uh, yeah, just choosing the, the perfect moment to go back when there's no real pressure on uh, this uh, nice wide roads, so we can go back, talk to John Lalang and uh, have a wee chat, have something to eat and, uh, you know, just gather the information that he wants for the last 50 kilometres. Three Skyriders at the back. Boston Hagen, Edmondson next to him and Kirienka just behind. Three minutes, 22, the gap continues to fall. This wooded area around uh, Limburg. 
Well, if you like the race, like how it looks, and if you like the touring and competing and having a look around, you can come to Limburg, cycle the route anytime you want. It's all mapped out. And there's also an Amstel Gold Visitor Center just around the corner in Valkenburg, the historical heartland of this race. Very much similar to the, the Tour of Flanders Museum down in Udenarde, Flanders, Belgium. And on most of these roads, there are plenty of cycle lanes, as you can see. It's a nice, safe setup. And if you want to know, the bicycle has right of way over just about everything in the Netherlands. It is the country with the biggest percentage of cyclists per population in the world. 90 odd percent of Netherlanders cycle a bike. Just looked as if there, Peter Winning for uh, Orica Green Edge was just kind of trying to launch something. He knows that uh, the pressure is on from Movistar. We are on. Uh, Obviously, one of these kind of long climbs, and uh, Orica Green Edge. I've, I've I've ridden well recently over the last few weeks, uh, especially with Simon Gerrans in the uh, Catalonia and the Basque Country, and Peter Winning, obviously a Dutch rider in this um, set, this Australian setup, obviously trying to do something, and it puts the pressure on uh, the riders that are going back for bottles. Not often the, the best place to go back for a bottle, and he's hanging on the back, and he's carrying a few extra kilos there, and. Sometimes in these situations, uh, if you're really struggling at the back with all the bottles, it's better just to get rid of them and go back to the car again. Miguel Minguez there of El Scaltel. 24-year-old from Bilbao. Relatively new to the professional scene. Vorgonov at the minute at the front for Katusha. Garmin riders we're hearing on the race radio has gone down. Waiting for a name. Can't see anything in the picture. Certainly hope that it's not Van Sumeren out there in the break. Argo oh, Shimano coming to the fore again. We mentioned Simon Geske who was up there and finished well. Good news that Van Sumeren isn't the man that's gone down. Three minutes six again, another 20 seconds quickly shaved off in the space of two or three kilometers. Yeah, he's trying to get as far into this race as possible. That's the man in front of the blue van somewhere and so much experience. And so has the, the rider in orange, uh, Astroloza. But uh, for, for Van Summeren, he doesn't want to be brought back now. He wants to try and get into this uh, final, final effort so that uh, you know, his team leaders can just sit and uh, follow the wheels because it's so important to saving as much energy as possible. And if he's still in front, the uh, penultimate climb up the uh, Coburg, then you know, it puts uh, less pressure on uh, the Garmin Sharp team. So doing a very good team job at the moment. And that's what he was always good at. OK, he popped up with a great one in uh, Paris, Paris-Roubaix a few years ago. And it's just his efforts of being in front. So just trying to keep the pressure on a very good tactic. I believe it's Eric Van Lanker that's in the car for uh, Garmin Sharp. And, you know, a rider that's uh, done well in this race in, in the past. So, you know, he's a, a rider with great experience. He's just having a wee word with um, Pluskin. Pluskin really struggled in that, uh, that claim just before, so not really um, prepared to help the, the likes of um, Astraloza and uh, Van Sommel. 50 kilometers to go and a very interesting development. Orica Green Edge turn on the pace and start to help this chase now. All set up for a good attack today by Simon Gerrans. Michael Albazzini involved as well. They've got Clark, Impey, Matthews, Mayer, Salzburger and Veining. A superb team together for the Aussies. And having uh, sat back and watched all the work being done by Katusha and Movistar. Now with the gap almost at three minutes, Brian. 50 kilometers to go, they've suddenly decided to get involved. Well, sometimes either it, it gives it away that um, Simon Gerrans is feeling good or the sports director has told guys to get in the front in order to um, to give the likes of Simon Gerrans a bit of a kick up the backside. Um, so it can work in both ways. So either the sports director has ordered this uh, to the fact that uh, sometimes when your uh, team is riding on the front, it puts a wee bit of pressure on you. It's one of the things that um, Mark Cavendish used to say when he finished a, a stage. I sit behind my team all the stage. They bring back the breakaway and the thing that's on my mind when I sprint, I don't want to let anybody down. So a lot of the sports directors put their team on the front because it puts a wee bit of pressure on their, their team leader to try and, you know, give that back. And, uh, you know, it's a good tactic used by a lot of teams. Not every team, but a lot of teams uh, tend to use that. Just gives the, uh, the team that confidence, riding on the front. 
uh, gives the uh, the team leader that wee bit of um, you know kick up the backside that he doesn't want to let, let the rest of the team down, down that have done so much work earlier on in the race. So uh, or Simon Gerrish feels good and he's he's decided that um, you know they want to uh, they want to continue and they want to show well. Well, a couple of the riders pressing their earpieces to their ears, so you might be right that those instructions are being barked through by Lorenzo Lapage, who's the man in the car today for them. Backing Simon Gerrans to the hilt, then, it seems. The man who won Milan San Remo last season. Spent all spring trying to get himself ready for these uh, Ardennes. Put in the hard kilometres in Catalonia and the Basque Country. Worth remembering as well, he's won a stage in both races as well. So he's in good form as we see Thomas Decker who doesn't certainly look to be uh, in any sort of form out of the back. Three minutes, three. Four riders lined up for Orica Greenwich. Skin suits being employed as well by a few of their riders. BMC not far from the front. Again, interesting to see where their tactics lie with Gilbert and Greg Van Avermaet. Van Avermaet must be absolutely tired out after a long sprint. Well, he seems to think he's got, he's held his form right from um, Het Neusblad, right from the, the first kind of classic of the of the year. So, you know, he's happy enough and he can play a major part of this race today in Amstel Gold. And if he continues to have stuff left in the tank, then he's going to be important. We saw him really dragging and pulling Gilbert and then Sagan as well. At one of the major climbs in what was the big attack in Brabant Pale on Wednesday. Flesh Brabanson, as it's also known in French. The Flemish Arrow. Exactly. The Brabant region. Had the Wallon Arrow on Wednesday, the Flesh Wallon. Better known of the two races. You can just see people really jockeying for position here, Brian. Cannondale all bunching up together. Well, it's uh, good for them. Uh, they have come up towards the front. They have got um, three riders round uh, Peter Sagan, one just behind as well. So they've got four riders left and so many other teams willing to come up and put the, uh, the effort on it. It just means that um, Cannondale and the line green can sit back and you know save their energies if they can for uh, helping uh, Peter Sagan because Peter Sagan can he's shown us he can win in a, a bunch sprint or he can win on his own and uh, you know this this person is he's he surprised us year after year after year and he you know he's coming up to to one of these uh, legends in cycling he's only 23 so um, he's got Plenty of years, 10 years in front of him. You just see some of the riders choosing to go on the, the pavement, uh, the sidewalk here, and uh, you know the spectators there. And he, he risks that, and them jumping over and getting caught out. So um, not always the, the best to jump on. It's always like, easier to stay on the roads and races and uh, leave the cycle paths to uh, the spectators. Especially when we've got big no entry signs around them, like the one we saw there, the motorbike having to stop. As we see Sagan's Cannondale team come to the fort. Yeah, can, they, Cannondale can just sense a bit of nerves in front of the peloton. There's a, you know, riders coming back from the breakaway now. One of the accent jobs riders is, I think it's Detroyer now, coming from the front to the back very, very quickly. It's going to slide straight out the back, surely, with that pace. Dear, oh dear. Well, you mentioned Sagan there. 14%. This is one of the hills that really, really bites. It just goes up to the that inflatable, turns right. And it doesn't go downhill straight away, it kind of falls flat, and that's the bit that really, really hurts your legs. Gulpenerberg, 10% average, and as Brian just said, maximum 15%. Only 600 metres long, but already pushing, struggling. Everybody out the saddle, really. Astad Loza should be the best climber in here. Of course, he has Basque blood. And some room now, pedalling away. I don't understand why Astralos has got this climb so hard, so difficult, and uh, you know, it is only a short climb, this is the steepest part of it, and there's a bit of respite when you go round this corner and turn right, but uh, it's better keeping these two riders with them, they still have just almost three minutes, but this is the how that the, the rest of the race are, are, are battling to get into first, you can just see it kicks up and 
any changing of gear or fluffing gears that um, you know you can see riders uh, you know walk uh, this climb if they can't get by and this is why it's so important to keep near the front and that's why the uh, race is on in a bunch to get good position on this climb also important all these climbs to get good position but this one in particular because it isn't so wide it's so steep and there's more of a chance of uh, slipping a gear or uh, somebody having a mechanical and when that happens you just have to stop well, the peloton are following. Look how far it's strung out now. We're going to see, as Brian said, all of that jockeying for position here. Everybody who is anybody needs to be close to the front now. Second and final passage of the Goldplitterberg. From there, we'll head on to the Kreuzberg, which is 800 metres long again, an average of 7.5%. Acer Bosweg will come over that. The Fromberg, Kotenberg, which is the steepest of roads in the Netherlands. I'll tell you what, Robbie, Cannondale. Cannondale doing a very, very good job here. They've been sat back uh, for the last uh, you know, 20, 30 kilometres, letting the other teams do it. Coming up at the right time here, they want to put Peter Sagan in the best possible place coming into uh, this next climb. It's just not the climb, because you've got this climb, your legs are absolutely bursting, and you go round the top. And this is what we're talking oh. about. You get caught behind a crash like this, anything could happen. A lot of pushing and shoving to get up towards the front, and this is the sort of thing that happens. And it's just as you turn right, and if you're halfway down the bunch, the riders are already going over the top of this climb and the, you know some other riders are still on the climb, so that's why it's very important to stay Local in the front of this race. Local boy, local boy, Rob Reich from Valkenburg is the man struggling to get back on his bike. No wonder he had his hands on his head. He's not one of these men who was a crosser, but he might as well have been looking at that picture. A mega former, or I should say, Ulrika Green Edge man's gone down. For Katusha, it's Rodriguez. Joaquim Rodriguez. Yeah. Well, any, any, any idea that he might have had has just perhaps gone out the window, and he's looked hurt as well as Joaquim Rodriguez. Not good for the Catalan rider. <laughs> I was just looking at the numbers, I saw 75 and that has his, his number so uh, yeah, Rodriguez looks as if he's, he's not going to chase and try and get back on, he looks as if he hurt himself and he, the reason, one of the reasons why I can't see him finish is he looks as if he has hurt himself this race wasn't a target for him, it's more important to uh, recover for the likes of Flesh for on and Lee's best on Liege Purito certainly won't be cigar smoking away tonight BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race continues after a quick commercial break. More from the Netherlands on the other side. Reducing. Selections being made. And here we go. The list of hills to come. Asa Bosveg is uh, the one that Astad Loza has moved on to. Just over a kilometre long, 8.1% average gradient, and look at that maximum of 16%. Yeah, the bunch are on a, 
quite a fast uh, descent and uh, you know they've got a left and a right back onto this climb and just seeing I think it was the Lithgard um, of uh, Vacon Soleil wanted to kind of push on on the, on the descent of this climb but the Astro Lows are doing a, a very good job of staying out in front here he's still got 2 minutes and 38 seconds inside the last uh, 40 kilometres 25 miles but he must be so tired these riders or oh, the original 7 man breakaway in fact uh, Van Summeren went after 12 kilometres so you can just see this is a steeper part, just up towards the top of this climb now. He's going to go over the top with uh, just under two minutes, but it's coming down very, very quickly now. As you say, under two minutes and under 40 kilometres. 39 to go, one minute 50 for Mikel Astarlosa. Plushin and Van Summerlin, who were formerly breakaway companions of his, slipping all the way back to the peloton almost now. And look at the pain on the face of Van Summerlin. It is a hard, hard day. Twenty-eight seconds between Asta Laws and those two men. This is what's happening in the peloton. All of the main contenders starting to get themselves in the right position. They now move on to the Azer Bosvik. After that, it'll be the Fromberg and then the Kuttenberg. As I said, it's 12 kilometers into which four big selective climbs, certainly at race pace anyway, are packed. And then after that, they've still got four of the bigger climbs still to come. It is an unforgiving race. It's a hard race. So complicated, so difficult to control. And we're just approaching the moment where all the emotion, drama and tension is going to be packed now. the right-hander remember the mental aspect of this race so important as well so so vital to keep concentration you've been stressing for quite a while there's Diego Lisi now he wants uh, a podium from his next three races former double-time junior world champion Peter Veining. Looks like his style. Yeah, Peter Veining and uh, Nordaug for uh, Blanco just uh, pushing hard. Bit of surprise for uh, Veining because uh, just in that slow motion we saw that uh, Gerens was uh, down towards the back of that uh, main group. But uh, Peter Veining obviously showing some good form from the Basque country. Nordaug just struggling to go with him. So uh, now we're starting to see some of the uh, protagonists of this race starting to push forward. 37 kilometers, still a long way to go, but uh, the likes of Peter Winning doesn't want to just sit back and wait for the likes of uh, the Gilbert v uh, Sagan contest. He wants to try and push out, and obviously that's why they came to the front earlier on. Uh, about 10 kilometers ago, kept the pressure on because they want to try and split this race up. Well, he's a Dutchman from Harkema, former Rabobank man. He's won the pink jersey on the Giro, the year that Contador last won it before it was stripped and given to Michele Scarponi. And Summer again drifting back, around 30 seconds behind Astar Laws at the moment. So the shot we saw of Albazzini and uh, Gerens. Gerens was actually wearing a skin suit. Interesting tactic from him. Again, all that aerodynamic help that he wants. He must be having other people carrying his food for him. And we're being told now that there are 46 seconds that separate this man and Astad Loso. So drifting back all the time now to the peloton. Johan van Summelen. This is the man out front. At least we had him in motion for a moment. Just seem to have one little problem with our motorbike following the peloton. And then a little later the breakaway as well. Great to see so many supporters out there. The Dutch flags, the real moment that Astad Loso broke. The men that were with him Powerful attack at ascent on the Kreisberg. He took on to the uh, Asia Bosveg on his own and heading towards the Fromberg now. And 
again, apologies for lack of live images at the moment. We're just being told there is uh, a connection problem at the moment with the motorbike at the front, the one that carries the picture. I've never wondered how pictures have been back from a race as we thankfully get him back. Gamasta Loza. And this is Peter Veining on his way to try and join him. Veining jumping away in the Orica Green Edge jersey. Again, we talked about the strength of their team today. So many tactical options. And the first card has been played. The local boy, the Dutchman, the former Rabobank rider, now with Erika Greenedge and attempting to try and join Astan Loza. Yeah, we go down this road and uh, we turn right onto the next climb. Uh, Astan Loza is already on it. So uh, this is a kind of long drag, very open and uh, quite lucky that uh, the wind isn't blown across it. Uh, the uh, conditions here for the... Uh, Amstel Gold Race 2013 are absolutely perfect. The first time that uh, a lot of these ra riders have had their uh, summer jerseys on and uh, enjoying the temperatures here. So uh, Astralos are doing the, the ride of the day from the original breakaway of uh, seven riders. Well, once more, this is the moment that uh, the second version of that breakaway was broken. It looked as though for a minute that Van Summer might be able to follow Astralos, but he was just too strong for them. Again, the wisdom of the bunch separating there. Has to be questioned, but Aston Loza, to be fair to him, has continued to ride strongly. Perhaps he just felt that the others had nothing left to give and were slowing him down. It's certainly a busy and big decision to make. Busy in the sense you've got almost a heck of a lot of things going on in your mind as well. Well, Van Summeren was trying to keep uh, it together earlier on, and he was trying to encourage the, all the other riders uh, in the uh, kind of second division teams to, to keep the pressure on. Um, but obviously, it does not the legs when Astroloza went, and Astroloza now on his own. Marcus Burkhart leads into the climb for BMC. So, uh, Gilbert obviously feeling feeling good and, uh, you know, want to keep the, the pressure on. I don't think we're worried. There is four kilometres to go for Astroloza. is starting to get very, very tired now. You just see Grimison. We're on this claim from Berg, maximum 10%, and this gap coming down under uh, two minutes. Well, one of the better Newton. hills on which to attack for Veining, you feel. Not the steepest. Yeah, we saw Lugutin down towards the back there, Bekistan champion, and now on the from Berg, he's decided to go after uh, Peter Veining. So Lagutin getting involved as well. Inspect national champion, Veining out there. The minute, they don't seem to be uh, too interested in Lagutin. 1 minute 52 back to the peloton, Burkhardt on the front as Brian mentioned and another interesting tactical card for BMC and he's a very, very strong classic rider, Marcus Burkhardt. Lagutin pulling away by the meter. And it's what we said that if it does come back together with quite a long way to go, we're going to start to see a lot of these types of attacks with teams putting bodies out there and trying to test the water a little. But that's what they're trying to do. They're, uh, BMC and uh, Cannondale will try to control things. Well, you know, if, uh, a team like uh, Vacon Soleil or um, Orica Green Edge want to try and uh, win this race, they've, they want to try different options. Of course, they can keep one rider back to try and, uh, you know, go with the likes of Sagan and Gilbert and the final time up the Cobar. But they want to have another option, you know, plan B and trying to put riders out in front and uh, you know, leave the, the chasing to the likes of uh, BMC and uh, Cannondale. Now we're into the, uh, you know, the final few climbs and getting close to the final 30 kilometres is so important, but uh, so is uh, having numbers and uh, a lot of the, uh, the teams are, will now be depleted. Cannondale especially, they've ridden in the front uh, for so long earlier today. So it depends on how many teammates you've got back, you know, left with you. Quick conversation between Pushin and Van Summeren there. There's a head now towards the Kuttenberg. Quite thin roads out here. Everything's going to have to be stretched out to keep it safe. Something that we should see help the gap go down a little bit further. Here they come. Which is a lag with teams attack, by the way, isn't going to last too much. Garmin now putting a man on the front. You're watching BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race. We'll be back with more right after this. Here is Astad Losa. Comes the big turn. Yep, straight into the small gear and uh, just wants to try and pedal up this as much as possible. This is one of these climbs that gets steeper and steeper towards the top. It doesn't as if it goes downhill. It 
very, very difficult. You can just see they put barriers on it, but uh, at this 32 kilometres ago, this is a brute, 1,700 metres, and uh, no respite at the top. Maximum 22%. I must give credit to the superb inner ring cycling block who actually did the research and said that it is the steepest road in the whole of the Netherlands. 22% is horrendous. It's up where, in terms of the gradient, with the biggest climbs and the most famous climbs in the world. Of course, yes, it's short, but it's the 30th climb of the day. Let's not forget that. It's hard when there's over 200 kilometres in the legs. You've been up and down all day. You've been concentrating. There's not much energy left. And if there is anything left, it's going to sap it right out of you. Well, if it gets over the top of here, uh, the falls flat at the top for a, a couple of kilometres on a small road. And then we do have a fast descent uh, back in towards the bottom of the cobalt. So it does look as if he'll get onto the cobalt. But uh, again, you can't see him staying out there too long. You just see his body's absolutely aching from uh, the effort he's making. And, uh, you know, this is where the main decisive uh, move normally was made in the, the Amstel Gold. But as we can see from the top left-hand side of our screen, there's still 31 kilometres to go towards the finish. Van Summeren now struggling on these early big gradients, almost pedalling squares here. The effort there is overtaking by Veining, who reaches him. This is interesting. Just under a minute, I would guess, behind Astad Loza. Venning joining right on the back of the wheel of Plushin, who's kept a little better rhythm. This is a good ride by Peter Venning so far. Long, well, long way to go, yeah. He's inspired because he's a Dutch rider, okay, riding in a, a, an Australian team, but for me, if he wants to try and win this race, he's went out a wee bit too early, 30 kilometres to go. He's on his own. He, he never dragged anybody with him. Now we're starting to see uh, some riders from Blanco coming up. Uh, Nordog is in there. Uh, Stan, I've got uh, a rider in there. So more riders are starting to think, I tell you what, we're not going to wait for uh, the likes of Gilbert and Sagan. We need to put riders in front. Lars Pedernoghag, David Tanner and Andre Grivko. The three riders chasing Peter Venning there. Remember the Peter Venning's Grand Tour win in the Giro d'Italia, the day he took pink, and that was a heroic ride as well. It was a day that they had the sort of Strada Bianchi, the last time they did the stage, not the first time when it was hellish and rainy and horrible. It was a day in which uh, I think Tom Yelta Slagda had an Oscar for. But Venning went on to win the stage, win it absolutely brilliantly into pink, and he stayed there for, uh, I think it was four, five, six days. That was until Alberto Contador took the pink jersey and then rode it all the way to the finish. Is Astad Loza doing his level best to stay out. 30 well, kilometres credit, to go. Credit to him. He's uh, hanging out there and obviously the rest of these uh, breakaway companions have dropped back and uh, you know he's hanging out there. He's got some strength left in his legs. This is the man that's made the move uh, a couple of climbs ago. Uh, David Tanner, the, uh, you know, an Aussie riding for a Dutch team, um, doing a, a good job here for uh, for Nordog, the Norwegian team, in the same colours as uh, as Blanco, but this last year was the penultimate climb. This is where the race was really on, but we can just still see the still, you know, there's gaps uh, happening, you know, happening at the back of the peloton, but there's still 50, 60 riders left. Normally at this stage, there's, there would probably be about 20, 30 riders. So as predicted, we're going to see some more riders. If a rate, as Brian was saying to last year. Grief glint of Asta as he crowns the climb. Veining not too far behind him, I can tell you that. Now Plushin has been caught. Grivko pushes Tanner out the right hand side, gets between the two Blanco riders. Lars Petter Nordhag is the man out there in the front. The Blanco rider from Norway, Plushin for the moment will attempt to try and stay with these four. As one of uh, the jury motorbikes goes past them. Great to see the sunshine, I can tell you that. Certainly adds to the positive mood of the racing today. Been waiting for it for so, so long on European roads this way. Another indication of those gaps starting to attack and appear at the back. Ryder Hejdal, the man pulling them on the front. Remember, he was second in this race in 2010. Again, certainly with the change. Doesn't look like one that he'll be attacking. It's Dan Martin, as Brian said. The Garmin leader for this week. 
One minute 35 to the second group. Twenty-eight kilometers left. The Kuttenberg has been attacked. There are four kilometers remaining. We've got twice up the Korberg, and in between the Gullhammerberg and the Bemelerberg. Is that the van another ploeg zit? Ja, ja. Kun je misschien? Allee, Lord Gaus! Lampen, Ja, lampen, hè? Doe maar een klein niet meer, hè? Heading in towards the finish line for when uh, the bell will be rung and it will be final lap time. Final lap of a different circuit this time. Now towards the Gelhammerberg, Bemlerberg, and then Korberg once more. Fifty-five seconds between Astad Loza and those chasing him. Kunigo is one minute and fifteen behind, so he's well on his way to those. Uh, Five chasing. It's been an explosive attack from the Little Prince. And there are 22 kilometers remaining. He's pushing, as Brian said, a bit of a passenger here, and he's absolutely right. To finalize those time gaps for you, we're hearing on Race Radar that there's 1 minute and 40 seconds now between Astad Loza and the Peloton. Andre Grivko in his Ukraine champion's top. And listen to this. 
heading up onto the Korberg. Four climbs to go, including this penultimate ascent of this Korberg. And Asta Lorza fighting to keep the energy flowing to those legs that have been pedalling like pistons all day and getting enough encouragement to keep doing it. 900 metres long, maximum of 13%, an average of 7%. Remember, the race used to finish here. You see a few flags from the region of La Rioja in the north of Spain out there to greet him. Also, Scaltello Uscari traditionally taking riders from La Rioja, the Basque country, Navarra. But now in its globalised form, despite that, it's been the riders who were formed at the team who performed for them this week. Well, I suspect, suspect the uh, spectators, after being uh, drinking Amstel beer all day, will uh, cheer anybody, especially with that. Uh, De jury gaat het tussenuit. Kunigo wordt teruggepakt. Midden, 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 midden. Pina. Incredible as they crown the Korburg. Aston Lorsa can't be too long now in front. The pace has up significantly. Everybody who's anybody is involved and is there. And these five men in the breakaway are about to have company. Kreuziger, Marco Marcato. And I think that may be Caruso, it's with them as well for uh, Katusha, so they're three strong riders and uh, there is a reaction from the uh, front of the peloton, it looks like from uh, Amiga Pharma Quickstep, just uh, bringing back uh, Anton from Uscatel and one of the other riders uh, from Racon Soleil, so we're into the finishing straight, you can just see uh, Astraloza coming along to her commentary position and... Uh, Again, I'm going to say this again, Chapeau, what an excellent effort he's made out from a kilometre 12 with six other breakaway riders coming across the uh, the finishing line. You just see it up in the distance, a long straight line, and uh, he's going to make it 19 kilometres ago as he crosses the finishing line. What an effort he's done today. Mikel Astarloza, 
Approaching the finish line for what will be the last passage before the race really begins to look. The chase is on behind Kreuziger, Caruso, and of course uh, with him other quality company in the shape of Marco Marcato. The peloton isn't too far behind and also the riders that got away in the chase. The likes of Tanner, Slachter, Plushin as well, veining there, all chasing on and everything to play for with just over 18 kilometers to go. Aston Lozo will cross the line first. Five rider group behind him and the clock is already ticking. Peloton looking good, looking hungry, more attacks. Look like they're cooking up. Astana have plenty of bodies and shirts already at the front. There they go across the finish line. One final lap to go. The Belgian, Spanish, Flandrian, Dutch flags all fly proudly here at the finish line. A mega form of quick step cooking things up. Cannondale don't seem to have too many bodies left at the front now. I count three. Omega, Farmer, Quickstep have plenty. Ulrika Greenish still have Gerens in there. And Pedro Sagan is tucked right in the middle of that chasing group of a peloton that is starting to fracture more and more as the kilometres tick by. Yeah, we just watched them past the uh, commentary point we're in at the moment. Uh, a lot of people really struggling in this race. Ray Costa just going through the uh, the finishing line. Yeah, it's just splitting apart. And yeah, we did say this is it's what numbers you've got left at the front. And uh, you know, Cannondale have done a, a terrific effort for uh, Peter Sagan. But that's the tactic. We knew this was going to happen. We knew that teams were going to go out there and, and attack and attack and attack. They don't want to come to the the last time up the uh, the Coburg with Peter Sagan and Philip Gilbert. They know there's going to be a battle to the finishing line between the two. So what they're trying to do is keep on the attack. Rob Rouge still in the race, coming through the commentary point at the moment. So uh, chapeau to him. The local rider still in it. Uh, but uh, yeah, difficult time for a lot of riders and they have to go on the front. BMC in Canada, they want to win this race with all these riders attacking. They have to do something now inside the last 20 kilometers. If you're watching BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race, we'll be back with more right after this. Uh, Leukemans uh, for uh, Vaconsalai and uh, Fulsang now making an effort for uh, for Astana just sitting sit, uh, behind them. So it's all action here in this uh, final lap as we see Dan Martin uh, coming across the finishing line. So when we were thinking uh, Garmin, we're looking at uh, Dan Martin. Dan Martin crossing the finishing line with uh, some dirt, uh, obviously from a crash earlier on today. So count out Dan Martin. Count in. Just about all the men in this group for the time being, bar Mikel Aston Loza, who must be absolutely spent. The breakaway is over, and this now is the group that is bossing the race. Caruso is there, as is Grifko. We've seen Kreuziger. A look behind from Peter Veining, who's still up the front. Oh, Peter Winning coming from the Basque Country and finished, I think it was six overall, showing some good form. OK, he's made a bit of an effort earlier on. For me, Caruso is a big danger. Caruso, when we've seen the, uh, the stage that um, uh, was won by uh, Henal in the uh, Basque Country, and um, Caruso was one of the riders that came from the, the back and joined them just for a moment, and uh, I think finished third in that stage, a very difficult stage in the Basque Country. So he's pretty much at home in these uh, short, sharp climbs, and you just see at the front of the peloton, nobody really willing to, to chase. Look him and shake of the head. Uh, Phil Sang takes a drink. This is danger times. 15 kilometers to go. They've got some strong riders in front. 
looking very much like some of the predictions that they thought that uh, on this uh, final lap some of the breakaways would uh, would make it all the way to the finish because you look at the peloton nobody's willing to chase well how much is left in the legs i know that there's a lot of belly soul riders who's joined the group here certainly tell that by the short sleeves and van and is that van and there it is yellow van and there who spent some time off the bike a nasty, I think it was an esophagus problem he had in the Basque Country. Yeah, Simon Gerrans is also tucked in behind as well, so... Uh, that pulls everybody along. Yeah, of course it does. Uh, this is going to come back, uh, BMC bringing this back, but uh, yeah, just a few riders saying, come on, come through to the front, do your, your turn, but this group in front, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven riders now, not the original break of seven riders, but a new group of seven riders have what about uh, 20 seconds in the front of this group and if they work as hard as they can then you know who's going to chase how many riders have they got left so uh nord dog in the right caruso is also there grifko is still there and the white coming through to do his turn in the front kreisiger it looks as if uh, we've got uh, peter winning not doing his turn and uh, marcato sitting at the back Astro Loza, the rider of the day, just sitting uh, last man and taking tickets. He's not going to do any work because he has been done all day. Doesn't look with the flick of the elbow of um, Kreuziger that too many of the riders want to commit one, commit 100%. Well, there's still a couple of climbs to go here. The Bemelerberg and then the Kohlberg remain. Bemelerberg to come with uh, around 7 to 8 kilometres to go. Kohlberg inside the last couple of kilometres. There are 14 kilometres remaining. And groups one to two, just seven seconds separate them. The race is wide open, but as Brian's been suggesting, those behind in the peloton have to make sure they stay interested here and have to make sure that there's a will to chase. Otherwise, it's going to get very, very dangerous. Another flick of the arm there from Kreuziger. But the thing Aspen is, Lohs are hanging on. The thing is, Robbie, these six riders, OK, Ashra Lohs have been out in front, but the six riders in front have to commit. It's in their best interest to commit to, towards the, the finishing. And then battle it out the last time up the Coburg. They've got seven seconds with 13 kilometres to go. It's it's who's left in the bunch to chase. We know that BMC want to try and do something. We know that uh, Cannondale have got the riders left. We know that uh, Moreno Moza isn't in there. This is a time maybe BMC, if, if Van Avermaet is there, maybe should have had someone in this uh, group in front. But uh, it's left to uh, Cannondale and they are depleted in numbers. Well, Moser is dragged out the back, not involved. Remember, he spent a bit of time training at altitude in Tenerife, and he said that he was sick during that time as well. So he hasn't quite managed to recapture the form we saw in the early spring from him just yet. And that has left Pedro Sagan somewhat isolated. Sagan, way down in this group at the minute. We'll just look, Cannondale over one rider in front, and then behind them, you've got the teammates of most of the riders that are, uh, you know, got a man in front, so they're not going to do anything. So. Uh, yeah, there's no real concerted effort. Cannondale have to do something, but they're not going to bring back these seven riders with one rider. The other riders have to come in, and it's not just a Cannondale have missed out. There's other teams in this uh, main group that have missed out in this uh, front group. Omega Farmers Quick Step don't have any rider in front. You can just see a pink jersey of uh, Lamprey. So many riders missed out. They're looking good, better and better. Don't believe this is seven seconds, maybe a, a slightly more with uh, 12 kilometres to go. They just have to commit 27 seconds now. So it has gone out, as we thought. Nordog at the front for uh, Blanco. Alarm bell should be really ringing. This is a very strong group. And other teams have to come to the front to try and shut this down if they want to win Amstel Gold 2013. 12 kilometres to go, 27 seconds the gap between a very, very good group and the chasing peloton. Depleted numbers for Pérez again. BMC hiding at the moment. 27 seconds and if somebody who is a big name here wants to win this they have to have teammates up the front the question is how many have the big boys got left 12 kilometers to go 27 seconds and suddenly a mega former quick step begin to get interested here we've seen one lamper jersey there is that diego lisi or has damiano cornigo managed to keep right. his own position following his attack BMC, surely with Van Avermaet not too far from the front. This, in the meantime, is the big group up the front. Peter Veining is there in the Orica Green Edge top. We can see Roman Kreuziger, Lars Petter Nordhag, David Tanner, and that very dangerous-looking man in the Katusha red and white jersey, Gianpaolo Caruso of Sicily, Italy. Also present, Andre Grivko from Astana, who have plenty of bodies in the chasing peloton. 
and by some sort of a miracle, Mikel Astadloza is still in with the shot with 11 kilometres to go. Yeah, he'll just want to hang on as much as possible. He's been out there from kilometre 12 and everybody knows that and allowing them just to sit there. It's up to the six riders in front and all six riders, very strong riders. And uh, again, a wee bit of the unknown. For me, the big danger is Caruso for uh, Katusha, already showing some great form. Peter winning, OK, we would have said being a Dutch rider um, in this race with the form he had in the Basque Country, but he went solo for a while and he, he might be smarting slightly from that, being in his own for so long. But uh, yeah, these six riders, Kreuzig got another um, good good rider in this front group and it's left to um, Omega Farmer quick step um, to do most of the chasing here 24 seconds because Anton in third place in the arms for Uskatel isn't going to do anything because he's just sitting there thinking well this is a great chance for uh, Astraloza to finish seventh and get some world tour points for us it certainly is and uh, even if he does come back together he's great fantastically placed to attack on one of the remaining two climbs as well which is very much his forte let's not forget a little steeper they could be or they should be for him to have any real impact but he's in a good position gap going down now to just around 24 seconds but with 10 kilometers remaining two climbs remaining still opened up for just about anything to happen here looks as though there's some good good work being done now by omega former quick step on the front of this to me it looks less than 24 seconds he'll wait for the gps to update i would say it's just about inside 20. Kreuziger takes his turn on the front, Caruso and Veining. They seem to be the main three men pulling this along here. That as Nordhag comes through, just tell him apart with the, the Norwegian former champion flag and bands on his arms, on that and white and black kit. Great uh, green, yellowy shoes. They won't get lost commuting on the way home, will he? He doesn't need him today, it's been murky all spring, but finally the sun shines out and we have a real race on our hands. Ten kilometres to go in the Amstel Gold Race. The 48th edition of this wonderful event around the province of Limburg. And we have a breakaway that's been formed in the last 10 k's or so. Now heading on to the Bemelerberg. Penultimate climb of the day. Bemelerberg and Korberg remain. The Bemelerberg, the second passage of this, 1.2 kilometers as the pace is up by Grifko, and it's 4.1% average. There you go, a maximum of seven. And Grifko's little dig has just helped them on a little. Yeah, Grif Grifko is one of the riders. He's obviously uh, with numbers back in the, the peloton behind. They've had to, uh, they've had to go on the attack. He's not going to win it from the riders that he's got left. He doesn't have that sort of finish, but uh, yeah, this gap coming down. Now that Grifko has gone on the attack, then here comes uh, uh, Norhal as well. Norhal with the latest stick. Nine k's to go. Veining's trying to follow. We've seen Asta Loza attempting to be distance off the back, and Norhal, who's been in the counter attack for a good 30 kilometres now, has showed some good strength here. Nordog has found it difficult changing teams to uh, to Blanco. He, he was with. Uh, Team Sky, a really good rider for Team Sky, and uh, hasn't really done too much this year. But uh, Grifko, after making that attack, has now gone backwards, and we're left with a uh, Nordog in the right, Veening, the uh, Dutch rider in the left hand side for Orica Green Edge, Kreusker still in there with the yellow stripe, Saxo Tinkoff, and at the back, a big danger in the red. Uh, Katusha have uh, got Caruso in there, so it looks as if four riders now left with the uh, bunch behind closing fairly quickly. Mikel Astarloza's day over, he drifts towards the peloton. Grifko broken alongside this man, Marco Marcato, who looked to be a danger. And just look how close the peloton are now. Astarloza already being rejoined by the Omega Pharma quick step. And watch out for Igor Anton here now, because he's well placed. And you'd have to think that he'd have a go from somewhere. Probably on the Korberg. Surely don't think it's hard enough for him to make a real difference then. Certainly with the 1.8 kilometres after it. Well, it does look as if the uh, is closing down here. Grifko by the skin of his teeth coming across. Mercato still distanced. You can just see the wind coming from the left to the right of our picture. So it looks as if all over for Mercato. But uh, 
what an effort there for Griffko coming across, attacked at the bottom of the climb, got distanced and, uh, you know, is hanging yeah, on. Five riders now in front of uh, this year's Amstel Gold with the bunch still in, uh, in sight. And for me, Philip Gilbert is leaving all this to the Coburg, like he did in the World Championships last year. He's leaving it all to the Coburg. It'll be good to get a look at that chasing route because I'd love to know where Sagan is here. In the meantime, it's Haystar. The huge frame of the Giro d'Italia winner pedals away, and he's going to have a go here. And some are in the break all day, they have to try and do something, but back to the front, it's Kreuziger for uh, Saxo Bank. Tinkov have decided to go on the attack and try and go alone. Well, he's a man who is desperate for some individual success. He's had to change his goals as a rider in the last few years. Have to think that the move to Saxo Tinkov is a positive one for him, because it takes the pressure off him. That Astana, all the pressure on him in the Giro last year, didn't quite make it as a leader. And he's got to look to these sorts of races to get his success now, and he looks very, very strong indeed. Definitely strong rider, and uh, he has distanced the others. He only has a, a slender advantage, and Vining goes through to the front in the green for uh, Orica. Norgard tries, but uh, still no big reaction from the peloton. We see one of the Radio Shack riders trying to come across to Heisadal, but uh, nobody taking control of this race. Some of them still saving that effort for the last time up the Coburg. A big, big effort being made here by Rada Heisdahl. He's put some real distance between himself and those chasing. We'll see if he can get to bridge the gap, then there'll be a quick chance for a rest. It looks as though he really has buried himself with this effort here. Kreuziger in the meantime continues to look strong. Again, the wind dropping right off. You can see the windmill and the flag barely moving. And they're heading towards the final climb of the day. Caruso decides that they cannot wait any longer here. They have to work hard together. Caruso veining in second place and Grivko inside the third place position there. Veining looking behind. What's going on, guys? We need to work hard. Let's go. Yeah, they're committed. They have to. They have to do something. They're fully committed. They've got one rider in front, and uh, they have to commit themselves. And that's what uh, Kreuziger is doing. He's committing himself 100% to win or lose. He's going to give it 100%. You've got him between the Blanco rider of Nordog, but uh, Caruso goes through in the red for uh, Katusha. Grifko hanging in there. Peter winning at the back for Orica Green Edge, but. Uh, there's still not a lot in it. 21 seconds back to the main peloton. There's still some big favourites in there. Long, long way to go in terms of drama and what could happen here. Not too long in terms of distance. Six kilometres, about to come five. 
crowds start to build on the side of the road. I can tell you the cheer on the Coburg is going to be huge. And then crowd lining the route for the last kilometre and a half or so. And plenty. I can tell you there are about 20 bodies deep here at the finish line. There are loads of people about all ready to welcome whoever is going to finish first here. Nordhag has been caught. Now a group of four chasing on. And again, they can't afford to hang about. Caruso isn't hanging about. And there goes the counter-attack. Quickly followed by Grifko and Veining. Nordhag hanging on the coattails of that. But with less than 5Ks to go, 26 seconds between Kreuziger and the peloton. With this man right at Haystyle joining on those chasing behind. They've just called in the neutral service car to uh, follow uh, Kreuziger, so uh, this gap is healthy enough. He's going to need about 40 seconds as we hit the, uh, the Colbert. Still, anybody's race, a rider from this uh, bunch can still win this race, but it depends on who's committed and who's got the riders left to bring this man back. We're on to this uh, very fast descent, and this takes us all the way to the bottom of the Coburg, and then he's only got that between him and victory. Is it going to be enough? We're going to have to wait and see. I'll tell you what, people who will be delighted with how this race is coming out is the organisers. Talk about the route change. Excitement right to the last here. And this is looking good for the people out front, but not so much so for Ryder Heystal, who shakes his head and looks absolutely tired out. Well, in the past, we've seen the uh, group finishes, uh, you know, a group of 20, 30 riders come to the finish together at the bottom of the Coburg. We have some seen individual brilliance and uh, individual wins, even off one individually, Frank Schleck before that. But uh, it's going to take a big, big effort for uh, Kreuziger if he still wants to hang on for the win here. Ben Hermans for Radio Shack Leopard has put a real dig in. He was exceptionally strong in the week in Brabant Chappelle. He's carried on that form here in the breakaway on Wednesday and surviving very close to the end. Now it's the Kohlberg. This now is the final climb of the day. Inside, two and a bit kilometers to go. And this is Roman Kreuziger, the race leader, with what we're hearing is around 20 seconds of a gap. Group behind looks tired, looks spent. There looks like there is no will to chase here. Well, and this, this is last year's finish. Kreuzer has got, got this in the bag, but we have got another 1.6 kilometers. Hermans comes through and he, he's closing on these uh, he, these intermediate riders. But where is the group? Where is the main group? Because for me, the round the corner now. Are. This is going to be touch and go whether Kreuziger managed to hang on towards the finish. Well, the Coburg, the fourth and final passage here on the 48th Amstel Gold Race. 1.2 kilometers at 5.8%. At the moment, it is the rider from the Czech Republic, Roman Kreuziger, leading them up, but he's being chased by a group that is in itself about to be swallowed by a main peloton who is hungry for victory as well. The motorbike's been ushered out the way quickly because here come the main men and here comes Philippe Gilbert. Sagan not far away on the wheel, Gilbert. He's gone. Sagan's launching gone. Sagan's his attack. Gone. Sagan cannot go with him. Gilbert looking good, looking strong. Gerens can follow him though, and this. Put your money in! Yes, 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 yes! Okay! Yes, 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 yes! Yes! The boy! Gilbert, Gilbert! Kilometer. 
One kilometre to go. Croizier looking OK at the moment. Has to ride for dear life. Excitement to the end of the Amstel Gold Race. Behind him, chasing, very hungry. And in the World Champions jersey is Philippe Gilbert. The question is, does he still have time? Valverde at the moment, number 107, on the wheel of Simon Gerrans. This is this little false flat bit now before they head into the end. It's been crowned by Roman Kreuziger. Kreuziger pedalling away, and here comes a counter-attack now. Valverde, who's been sitting, waiting, has finally pounced. The question is, has Gilbert spent his effort and can these guys work together enough in the last 300 metres to catch Kreuziger? For me, they're aiming for seconds. Kreuziger's had enough in the tank now to hang on. He's looking round. He has got about 10 seconds. That's it. One kilometre to go now. And uh, Gilbert looks as if he's about to be caught by uh, Valverde. Just eases ever so slightly. Joined by Valverde and Gerens. For me, these guys are riding for second and third. Kreuziger looks as if he's got this in the bag. Well inside that last kilometre then. And Roman Kreuziger has a decent distance. Three men chasing behind would have to work together miraculously well, but it's Roman Kreuziger who looks as though he's going to take one of the biggest wins of his career. Kreuziger, who's won week-long stage races, he's been touted as an ex-big GC thing, but here he has put in a wonderfully timed attack and looks to be darting to the line to a victory. Roman Kreuziger wearing 171, the leader of Saxo Tinkov, who we hardly talked about today, has put in an attack at an opportune moment and is riding on here in the sunshine for the first time in spring, lifts his arms, and Roman Kreuziger celebrates winning the 48th Amstel Gold Race in superb style. And as Brian said, we are going to have a sprint for second. Gilbert, the first, they've allowed the bunch to catch them, and this is anybody's how much energy is left here. Gilbert, twice winner, leading it out. Sagan, remember, distanced and outside the way, it's not going to be Gilbert, Valverde looking good. And it means between Valverde and Gerens in the other two spots on the podium. But this is the main news, it's Roman Kreuziger, who's won. Roman Kreuziger. Well, they're asking a few questions. Let's see if we're going to hear from him. Easy, he says. There you go. That was his swan Europe saying it was easy. I don't think that was an easy win for him all the way to the end. In the sprint. This is the winner, though. The main man on a big day. The warmest day we've had on a bike this spring, this summer. 20 degrees being enjoyed by just about everybody, but nobody will have enjoyed it more than the man at the front who receives his trophy. Francesco Moser and the rest of the presentation party handing out the trophies. And Roman Kreuziger is the winner of the 48th 